Good morning, everybody. Welcome to WCC again. It's good to have you with us. Good to see you today. We'll be worshiping God in just a few moments, of course. Uh, a bit of a thunderstorm this morning. You got some lightning and some thunder. It didn't last very long, but I know my kids, they both asked me, are we going to church today? I said, yeah, yep. just because there's thunder and lightning, you can go to church. We can still make it out. Just because there's a storm. There's a, there's a sermon in there somewhere. Uh, I've got a couple of announcements for you this morning I want to give you before we do get started. Uh, first of all, just a reminder, there's going to be a brief business meeting again next Sunday. Uh, we tried to settle th some things last Sunday, and uh, we got partway through, but we also have some new information to share with regard to the roof being uh, replaced. And so we want to talk about that next Sunday, try to make a decision to move forward on that. So that's good. Uh, secondly, our potluck lunch is happening right after church today. If you came to church this morning having no idea that there was a potluck lunch afterwards, you are still 100% invited. Uh, we just try to bring some food to share with everybody. There's lots of food, so don't worry. Please do stay with us. Uh, we like to fellowship and have a good time together. But more than that, we're actually seeking to raise some funds for our local YFC missionary, Anna DeRyke. So if you're able to ha uh, give any kind of donation towards that during our potluck lunch, that would be wonderful. And all of those proceeds will go to her. And so there's more than just one reason to join us after church today, uh, just for fellowship, but also for supporting her. So if you're able to stay, again, we'd welcome you to stay and join us. Or join us. Uh, thirdly, church baseball is starting up soon, uh, May the 7th. Uh, Matt Jolly up here, he leads that. It's $40 for the season. If you want to join baseball, just talk to him after church sometime, give him a message. I'm sure they'd love to uh, have you uh, join the team with them. So I believe those games are Tuesday nights, and they range from like 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, so that's kind of the commitment you're looking at, Tuesday nights. Again, you can talk to Matt to get a little bit more information about that. They uh, are reigning champions. You know, if that draws you in, gives you, gives you a desire to be part of the winning team. Yeah. Uh, then lastly, uh, there's some soccer information I want to just keep you up to date with. For those of you who are soccer volunteers, well, if you're not a soccer volunteer and you'd like to help be a volunteer, you're more than welcome to sign up at waterfordsoccer.com. You can sign up to be a volunteer in a number of different ways. Uh, but a couple of things that are coming up shortly, there's going to be a training session on April the 26th for all of our coaches and the workers who are kind of working with our, our children. So the training session is on April the 26th, that's a Friday, 7 to 8 p.m. here at the church. So if you want to mark your calendars for that, that'd be great. We need our coaches especially to take part in that training session. We do a, uh, uh, we do a vulnerable uh, kind of little session to help our, our coaches understand how to work with young people, uh, vulnerable people as well. And so that's really a mandatory session for the coaches and for anyone else just seeking to be part of that. You're more than welcome to join us. Uh, so that session's on the 26th, on the Friday there. But then there's another one. We're doing a soccer uh, jersey sorting on Monday, April the 29th. Now, that's kind of just penciled in my calendar because if a bunch of you say that Monday doesn't work, we might move it to the Tuesday. But you can put in your calendar for the time being, Monday, April the 29th, 7 o'clock here at the church. Again, that is a particular event that if, if you don't, have the ability to help throughout the entire soccer season on our Thursday nights, and you want to just come and serve in some way, uh, like maybe the one time on the Monday night, uh, by coming and helping us sort out all of our jerseys, get them all packaged and ready to go for the kids, that'd be a great way to help us as well. We come here at the church, it takes about an hour, hour and a half to get the, the jerseys all sorted out and put on the proper teams, and then they're able to just be packaged and given to the kids when they come in on the early check-in night. So if you're able to help on that night, that would be a big help as well. So you can talk to me about more details if you'd like afterwards. But yeah, we're looking for soccer volunteers, looking for help sorting those jerseys on the Monday, April 29th. And then importantly for you volunteers already who are signed up, training session on April the 26th. That's a Friday night, 7 to 8.30 p.m. I think that's really the bulk of what I have for you this morning. Again, if you'd like to be on our email list and you're not, talk to myself. Uh, or talk to Becky. She's here this morning too, I believe. I think she might be in the nursery. Uh, but in any case, talk to me or Becky. We can put you on the email list. You can get the deeper, more exhaustive announcements to keep you informed about everything that's happening here at WCC. Well, this morning, as we go to the Lord in worship, we're going to just pause, go to Him in prayer, commit this time to Him, 
uh, before we do start singing uh, praise and worship to him. So if you're able, please stand with me, and we'll open up our time by going to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we bow before you this morning, help us to quiet our hearts. Help us to come before you with the peace and understanding of your gospel, a message of salvation through Christ, a great gift that you've given us, Father, that we celebrated not too many weeks ago on Easter. Uh, we pray, Father, that our hearts would just be overjoyed by um, what you have done for us and how you've empowered us to live for you. So this morning, help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Help us to worship you sincerely. Help us to know that you are a God and we have a special relationship that you've opened up to us. Now, well, this is why we worship. Father, help us to also understand uh, the many opportunities that you've given to us to serve you, to fellowship with the church family. Help us to be uh, invigorated, Lord, to be on mission for you uh, and to see the needs within our church family and to seek to meet those needs. Father, I pray that during our time of worship, uh, you would just ground us in the truth of Christ as uh, your word is opened up and shared later. I pray that your spirit would convict our hearts, Lord, that you would do this um, important and deep work of changing us, transforming us more into the image of your Son. Uh, help us to be motivated to go out from this place, um, honoring you with every part of our lives. And that, Father, you would be pleased with us as your people. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. All right. We're here. We're going to do a responsive reading this morning. And if you don't know what a responsive reading is, it means I'm just going to read a verse. And then you collectively together are going to read a verse. We're going to read through Psalm 23 to open up our, our service this morning. So I'll read verse 1, you'll read verse 2, and then we'll continue until we get to the end of the chapter. Now it may feel a little bit clunky, you know, trying to get words in together, but focus on the words that we're, we're saying. It's important for us to sing songs in unity. It's also a good thing for us to read scripture together in unity. So let's enjoy this moment and lift up this time of praise to the Lord. Psalm 23, verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me, God and your staff. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord.
and your love it pursues me all the days of my life I will rest my soul I'll trust in
can rescue me from my failing. Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God, only my holy God. Come and be holy, the one and the only. I will sing holy forever.
last song we're going to sing in preparation for the message this morning is a song that was on my heart earlier on this week. I don't know if you got to see the totality, the eclipse, but for me, that was just so awe-inspiring to see, wasn't it? Something that I've never seen before, and I can't truly explain exactly what I saw, but it was beautiful. That's one word I can say. And it's a testament because God says all of creation declares his glory, doesn't he? Amen. And that was one thing that was very clear in that moment, that it is God who put it all together. And there's no question. So let's sing this song in preparation for the message this morning, How Great Thou Art.
You may be seated. Those of you with young children who'd like to participate in our junior church program, come on up front. You got them sitting. And we do have another song congregation to sing, <laughs> so you are welcome to sit, but Amy would prefer oh, if you stand. I can't believe he let you sit. You can't sit for this song. A little Days of Elijah. We've got to ride right. some clouds. Oh, come on. going to pray for you, okay? All right, let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed for Junior Church. Heavenly Father, thank you again for uh, the joy that you bring to your church and for the good news of salvation through Christ. I pray that you would help our Junior Church leaders be able to communicate, again, the joy of the gospel uh, to these uh, young kids. We pray that they would grow in their faith and their understanding and that if any don't know you, they'd come to know you for the very first time. We just pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to get into God's Word this morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them up to Ephesians chapter 4. The kids have lots of energy. It reminds me that uh, kids love to dance. My kids love to dance. When I left for church this morning, they were dancing. I'm not even lying. Uh, as I left, they had some song on the keyboard downstairs that they were doing, and my girls were just dancing away without a care in the world. They don't have any training, and they don't know the different styles, like they don't know the tango or any of that other stuff. They just freestyle it, and it's wonderful. This morning, though, as we're kind of thinking about our faith and we're wondering about what God has for us, is that what God wants for us? Does He want us to freestyle? Or does he have a way, a certain way of life and expectations for us? 
The second half of the book of Ephesians, as we come to Ephesians 4, kind of helps us see that God has, of course, expectations. There's a right way and a wrong way to live. And the Ephesians chapter 4, the, the chapter itself kind of serves as a hinge. It moves from really deep theology, truth about God and about the gospel message and how we're saved and what he saved us to, and it moves into some of the more practical outworking of that theology. So chapters 4 on through 6 are going to deal much more with how to live life. So if chapters 1 through 3 are about the theology of who God is, what kind of gift of salvation has he given us, chapters 4 through 6 is how do we live out um, what God has told us to be and how to live. So Ephesians 4 is the way to live um, according to God. Now, in the Bible, there are many different ways the Bible describes how to live for Him. Here in Ephesians chapter 4, there's this phrase used that I think maybe many of you have heard before, but in Ephesians chapter 4, the way to live for God is described as a walk. So all of you Baptists in the room, you can praise God and thank Him that Paul didn't say, dance in a worthy manner of your call. There you go. You don't have to, you don't have to worry. You don't have to dance like the kids dance. It's okay. You've got to walk in a manner worthy of the call, though. That's certainly what the Bible is calling us to do and be and do. So this morning, my aim is that we would understand why God calls us to live life His way, to walk as He's called us to walk. I want us to try to see, like, why is it that we should walk the way God wants us to walk? Now, we're going to have lots of time to unpack exactly, you know, what is the walk itself. We'll talk about it today a little bit. We've got, you know, all of the rest of chapter 4, chapter 5 and 6. It's going to really show us what does this walk look like. But this morning, the main point is that we would know why. Why does God want us to walk in a manner worthy of His calling? So I'm going to read pa uh, the passage this morning. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading out of the ESV, and you can follow along in your own copy of God's Word, or you can look at the words up on the screen ahead. So the Word of God says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But God is calling us. There's this phrase I want us to see. God is calling us to, in verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And there's a word that I hope stands out to you right at the beginning. It's the word worthy. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you've been called. To walk worthy of the call. Worthy indicates a quality of something. The way we live our lives then should match the calling that God's given to us. You know, we think about if, if God's called us to live for Him, He's not called us to do it haphazardly. He's not called us to do it with minimal effort or just... A little bit of what his word has to say. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So first of all, we need to be thinking about, okay, God really does call us to a certain quality of living. Now, it may come as a surprise to some Christians because I think sometimes we think, well, God will just accept any old thing from me. It doesn't matter. As long as I'm trying, you know, as long as I have a heart for God. You know, there is a sliver of truth to this, of course, because God does accept us and He does want us to be trying. He does accept our hearts. And, you know, if, if we're doing our best and if we're coming to God in sincerity, He does value it. He wants that from us. He wants a sincere heart. But the Word of God goes on to describe how there are certain things, there are certain expectations, there is a way to walk worthily, and there is a way to walk unworthily. And so that should strike us right at the beginning if we don't like the fact that the Bible does give us specifications on how to live, well, the reality is the Bible really does paint this picture of a worthy walk. And so then we should be asking, well, what exactly is this walk, and why should I be trying to walk in a worthy way? Why can't I just walk any old way? 
Why can't I just live life any way I like? As long as my, my heart loves God, can't I just live however I want? Just leave me alone. If I'm not hurting anyone, that's fine. No, the Bible actually puts these extra responsibilities on Christians, these obligations to walk worthily. And the word worthily then reminds us there is a way that God ha would have us go. Now, why? Why should I try to walk in a manner worthy of the call? Well, first of all, because God's with you. Because God is with you. So look at the, you know, verse 1 as we begin. It says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. I therefore. The word therefore connects us to a preceding thought. And the preceding thought, I think, is very close at hand, although we could say all of chapters 1 through 3 is kind of what Paul is referencing when he says, therefore, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He's referencing all of it, all of the theology going back into the book of Ephesians, because all of this is true about God, about Christ, about your calling, about what God has saved you to. Because of all of it, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. But specifically, look at the immediate context just in chapter 3, verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Therefore, because of the power at work within us, within you, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. So God empowers us to walk worthily. He's with us. He's not just up in heaven, absent-minded, thinking, well, I sure hope they figure it out, and we'll see what they're doing a little bit later. God is with us, he says. This is why he's made us into a household, uh, a dwelling place for God, it says back in chapter 2. He's, at the, the work, uh, sorry, he's within us, power at work to cause us to grow in Christ and to live for him in love, of course. And then God's with us. Walk worthily because God is actually in you, living in you, and the power of God, of, of his Holy Spirit is at work in you. And now, we still have walking to do, right? Like, God isn't just mysteriously picking up our feet and moving them forward, like the power of God is in us, but there's the mysterious mingling of the will of God and the will of humans that come together. So when Paul says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, we still are reminded we have to do some walking. We have to put some effort. There's some decision to be made on my part. Yes, God is at work within me, but I have to follow after him. So Paul would urge us, it says at the beginning, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you, walk in a manner worthy. And he uses this kind of title that he uses on occasion throughout other epistles of his. He says, I am a prisoner for the Lord. He's referencing there his authority and the fact that he is an example to follow after as well. He's saying, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. God has captured me. I'm living for him. This is the authority by which I'm urging you. As someone who is following God, I urge you, the church, to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. But he's also a great example. And as he says he's a prisoner for the Lord, I believe we are to see in this statement an example that we're to take on as well. But I call myself a prisoner for the Lord, that I belong to Him. It's not meant to be taken in a negative tone, of course. You know, oftentimes in our culture and day, being a prisoner would be taken in a negative light. Like, that means you're a criminal, right, if you're a prisoner. But think of it, of course, as the Word of God would have us think of it. A prisoner for Christ or a prisoner for the Lord means I wholly belong to Him. I don't own myself. I'm not in control of my own life. I follow after the will of the Lord in my life. So he's an example. He has this authority to tell us, walk in a manner uh, worthy of your calling. But then he's also a great example. Be like him, be committed, be loyal, be self-sacrificing as the Apostle Paul was. And he's urging us on to walk in a manner. Now, the Apostle Paul isn't telling us to do anything that he hasn't already done himself. So as we walk in a manner worthy of our calling, there are some qualifiers that go along with it. To walk refers to our attitude, our behavior, how we live life. And so the Apostle Paul describes it this way. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. We'll look at verse 2 and 3. With all humility and gentleness, with peace, or sorry, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
So as you're walking and as you're living for Christ, do so with a particular attitude. Do so with the behavior that God expects. Gentleness, humility, patience, love, maintaining peace within the church family and with others as, as much depends on you. So a worthy walk is empowered by God, but it involves participation and effort on our part. So Paul can hold, the Apostle Paul, the Bible can hold these two ideas together, even though some might think there's a contradiction there. There isn't. The idea that God empowers us and the idea that we have to live in the expectations that He's given us, they go hand in hand. The reason we can walk worthily is because God has empowered us. But that doesn't take away from the responsibility, of course, that we have. So the first point of application that I would leave you with is this. As we consider that God is with us to empower us to walk worthily, I think faith then becomes apparent as the active ingredient. As we begin this journey of walking in a manner worthy, faith is the active ingredient in this point. We see in faith both belief and action. Faith tells us that God is with us. Is it possible for someone to just merely convince you that God is with you? Or is faith something that tells you beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know, I believe that my God is with me. The pastor might go on and on talking about how he is. I read about it in God's Word, the Bible. But faith is something that goes beyond intellect. It goes beyond knowledge. It is a belief. It is a trust that my God is with me. As the Apostle says, that He has given us His power, power at work within us. But do you believe that by faith? Because again, you cannot simply be told that. You cannot simply be convinced that intellectually. Faith is an idea that the Bible presents us. It reminds us that we have to come to believe. We have to believe that God is with us. But faith is not just belief. It's action as well. If I believe that God is with me, I'm going to turn this into action and I'm going to live it out. This is why, particularly in the Old Testament, we don't so much find the word faith in the Old Testament. We find the word faithfulness in the Old Testament. Because the Hebrew people, they didn't really like to deal in abstract ideas like the Greeks did later on when the New Testament was written. In the New Testament, you find a lot of abstract ideas, particularly from the Apostle Paul, and he'll talk about faith as a noun. You possess faith, this idea that you trust in God. But in the Old Testament, the Hebrew people, they, they rarely talked about the abstract idea of faith. They talked about faithfulness. That is, you living out your faith. So Abraham wasn't just a man of faith. Abraham was faithful. He had, he had faith, but his faithfulness was shown when he took Isaac up on the mountain and he was about to sacrifice him, right? Right? So the faithfulness of Abraham was in view. So the Bible will talk about the action of faith and the belief, or the mindset of faith as well. These two things go together. But as we think about our walk with God, how God has empowered us, it's apparent to me that faith is this key ingredient. If I don't believe that God is with me, if I don't believe that He has empowered me, of course I'm not going to live faithfully for Him. If God has a way for me to walk and live, and I read about it in His Word, but I don't believe that God is with me, maybe I don't believe He exists, maybe I don't believe that He's empowered me, maybe I believe that He's absent-minded, doesn't care about me. If I don't have faith in my God, well, of course I'm not going to live for Him. And I think this is one of the reasons why we see what we would call maybe professing Christians, Christians who declare to be Christian by word, their lives really don't show it in any way, shape, or form. The reason for that, I believe, is because ultimately there's a lack of faith. There isn't a real belief that God is there, God is with me, God has a way for me to live. If I really believe that God is with me and He has a way for me to walk, then I ought to step foot into it. I know that I'm empowered. See, the rich theology of the book of Ephesians, it reminds us that God has done a great work to save us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's not of works so that nobody can boast. So God has saved us. But then it goes on to say in chapter 2 as well that He has good works that He's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So faith isn't just believing who God is. It's believing and trusting that He's, he's shown me the way to live 
And now I'm going to set foot in faith and walk the way he'd have me walk. So walk worthy of the call because God is with you. Activate your faith and live for him. So secondly, walk worthy of the call because you have a new purpose and new identity. God has given you something new. If we look at that phrase, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Again, if a little bit of grammar is of help here, at the end of that verse, the calling to which you have been called. It harkens backwards, right? Something back, something you have been in the past called to. What is that thing in the past that God has called us to? Again, if you go back in your Bible to chapter 2, verse 22, it says, In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So you now are being built into this dwelling place for God. It's referring back to this great purpose that, that God has saved you for in the first place, that you would be this dwelling place for God. It says in chapter 3, verse 10, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. So you're a dwelling place for God. Through us, the church, the wisdom of God might be made known to the world. And then a little bit further on in chapter 3, in verse 20, the Apostle Paul reminds us, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work in us, that God is doing something in us to make us different. He would say, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. You and I were created to bring God glory by our salvation because He saved us. We are built together into a dwelling place for God through the church, the manifold wisdom of God being made known that we would be able to show the world the love of Christ being filled with the fullness of God because God is with us. And glory, glory be to Him throughout all time, right? So the purpose, the purpose of God saving us is for all of these reasons. That we would be God's holy dwelling place. That we would show the world who God is and the glory of God. That we would be able to display the love of Christ in our lives to be filled with all the fullness of God. This is the purpose of the church. And since you have this great purpose, walk worthily. But then we also have an identity. When we examine that word, the calling. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. There's a sense in which that word call harkens back to the purpose, but it also looks to the present and to the future for this identity. Who am I? So if purpose describes what we are to be doing, identity describes the distinguishing mark of who you are. So think about the word identity as this distinguisher. Who are you? And as the Bible describes it in verses 4 and 5 here, the distinguishing mark of the church is unity. It's interesting, isn't it? Oh, again, in other places of the Word of God, there are other distinguishing marks. Like if we were to read uh, the epistle of 1 John, John is very clear that we as a church are meant to have love. How can you say you love God if you don't love your brother? So love is one of the distinguishing marks of our identity, but Notice here in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is emphasizing this distinguishing mark of unity. So in verses 4 and 5, look at what the Word of God says. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's a kind of identity here being described for us and it all centers around this word one. And if we kind of further uh, explain or understand the word one, we're thinking about unity. There is one body, the body of the church. There are not multiple bodies of different kinds of church. God has one church. Now, we're a local church, and we're distinguished from, let's say, Villanova Baptist Church or Waterford Bible Church here in Waterford or other of these churches that are around. We're distinguished from them, of course, as a local body, but... The true Christians all make up one body. That is to say, there are not different kinds of churches that exist as separate entities or bodies that God looks at them in some way and says, well, there's one kind of church, or there's another kind of church. And there's, no, there's one body of Christians. There's one spirit. 
There are not numerous kinds of spirits that go out and indwell Christians or believers. There's one spirit, the Holy Spirit, and that is given to the church. There's one hope, the hope of eternal life, the hope of being with God forever. There are not multiple hopes. There are not different kinds of eternal lives. There are not different kinds of heavens, like maybe the really good Christians are going to go to one heaven and the not the average ones are going to go to average heaven. And then the ones who just get in by the skin of their teeth, they're going to go to the lower heaven. No, no, no. One hope. All Christians are looking forward to this one hope of being with God forever. One Lord. One Savior. We, we come to faith and trust. We, we come to salvation by one Savior, that is Jesus. Nobody else can save us. No other, no other little G God. Not, no, no one else one Savior, one Lord, one faith, one faith. Not numerous religions, not all roads lead to heaven, one faith, faith in Christ. One baptism, There's one entrance into the church, baptism. I know my Lord and Savior, when I know, sorry, know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and then as I'm baptized by my church into the church family, there's one entrance in to be part of the family. One baptism. So there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We are united together. This is the distinguishing mark of our identity. So the Apostle Paul, the force of what he's saying then is walk in a manner worthy of your call because of the purpose God's given you and because of the identity you have together. A worthy walk reflects the purpose and the identity of God's church. So a couple of points of application. God is calling you and me as a church to proclaim His glory to the world around us. That is, proclaim the gospel. This is purpose. Because you have been saved to a purpose, God wants you to walk in a manner worthy. A worthy walk is proclaiming His glory to the world around us. That is, proclaiming the gospel. But then secondly... God has given you a new identity. A worthy walk will walk in that identity. God is calling us to live in unity with His Spirit and with His people. So then, who are you with? As you think about your identity, and as the, the Bible calls us again and again to be identified not only with Christ, not only with the Spirit of God, but with the church, one body, one faith, one baptism. Who am I with? Who are you living for? I think many people, if you talk to them about faith, about religion, many, many people will tell you, well, I don't really have a faith per se. I don't really have any religion. But I'm spiritual. You hear people say this a lot. You know, I'm, spirit, I'm a spiritual person. Um, I have some connection to God. I, 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 I'm, I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual on my own, you know. <laughs> I, I'm one with God. Maybe you've heard people say things like this. Like, I've, I found a way to be one with God. I'm a spiritual person. I don't really want anything to do with the church or with organized religion per se. But here's what the Word of God is saying to us. Not only does He want us to know Him personally, He wants us to be united with His church. Let's be clear, the Bible isn't saying be united with the church so that you can be saved. I earn your salvation by joining a church. That's not what the Bible's saying. But the Bible is saying since you've been called to this great purpose and this great identity, be one together. You're one church, you're one body, living out life as one faith and one baptism, one hope, one Lord, one spirit. Are you together? God wants us to be united with Him, but He also wants us to be united with the church. And you know, some people say, well, you know, I tried, but the church, they did something that I didn't like. It bothered me. Hmm? They did. The church will bother you. I promise you this. The church will bother you. Now, let's be clear. I'm not talking about, like, grave sins of offense. That can happen in the church, and we ought to be forgiving, merciful, compassionate, of course. 
But more often than not, what we're talking about when we think like, I don't know if I can be united to this body of believers, you know, they might bother me. Yes, they will. No, not might. They will bother you. I want you to think about this. You don't have to put your hand up. How many times have you ever been bothered by another Christian? And again, I don't mean like they've sinned gravely against you, uh, they've done something horrendously offensive. I just mean bother. Like they were kind of annoying to me at one point, or they, they didn't say hello, or, well, gosh, the pastor didn't respond as quickly as I wanted him to, or he said something in a sermon that just kind of caught me off guard. Like the church will bother you. If you haven't been bothered by the church yet, You've probably not come to know them enough, or you've not just been in the church long enough. The church will bother you. I will bother you. I promise you this. If you're part of our church for any length of time, I as the pastor will come to bother you. Sometimes that's good, right? Sometimes people need to be bothered. Like we need to kind of, you know, get a little jab from, you know, I do too. The pastor will bother you though, in some not so fun ways either. Like I could very well say something that rubs you the wrong way. I could maybe ignore you. I I don't intend to, but that can happen. I may not do the thing as quickly as you want me to. That can happen. I promise you this. Every church you go to, you will be bothered by the church and the pastor. It will happen. Because I know that every single one of us are imperfect. So there will never be a relationship you ever engage in that is perfect. Husbands and wives bother each other. And that's supposed to be like one of the most sacred relationships out there, right? Like if husbands and wives bother each other, brothers and sisters bother each other, cousins bother each other, aunts and uncles bother each other, of course the church is going to bother each other. That's going to happen. Here's the problem. The problem comes when a Christian says, they bothered me, I don't want to be part of this anymore. Because then you will, you'll you'll be alone. You'll, You'll be separate from the church forever. You'll never find a church that doesn't bother you. You'll never find a pastor that doesn't bother you. Some of you are thinking, you know what, after the sermon, I'm going to go tell him, you know what, pastor, you've never bothered me before. And you know what I'll tell you? You haven't known me long enough. Just give it time. It will happen. And then there's going to be a whole slew of other people who read this message and say, oh, that means I can just unload all the things pastor's done to bother me. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get on my keyboard. You can do that. That's fine. I, I'd encourage you to, actually, in a serious note. Because the church is meant to be one. We're going to bother each other. It's not so much that, you know, whether we are or aren't, how do we work through them? How do we live in them? How do we show grace and love? How do we be empowered by God as the church, the one church? We are going to be bothered. We are going to annoy one another. There are going to be sins. And there are going to be sins as well. Some of them might even be grave sins against each other, but how are we going to work through them? How are we going to show forgiveness, grace, discipline? We are one church. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called because you have a purpose, you have a new identity. I want to encourage you to think about that identity. Not only your identity with Christ, one with Him in the Spirit, but one with the body. You feel a sense of oneness with the church, the church family. How are you going to go about living in oneness with the church if you're not there yet? I'd encourage you to think about that, to take the next step forward. Walk in a manner worthy of your call uh, because God is with us, because He's given us a new purpose and identity. And then lastly, walk worthy of the call because God himself is worthy. This is going to seem like an obvious point, but it's in the Bible, so if God thinks it's necessary, it doesn't matter how obvious it is, it's necessary. But look at what it says in verse 6. One God, Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. One God and Father. Imagine the audience the Apostle Paul was preaching to, first of all, to the Jew. They would have come with a prejudice, believing we're better, or us only. When the Apostle Paul says, one God and Father over all, he's reminding the Jewish person who might be prejudiced, the Gentiles are welcome too. 
There are not two separate faiths, not two separate baptisms, not two separate religions or gods. The glory of God is experienced now by all nations, open to all. God is over all. But then to the Gentiles, one of the things they would have struggled with coming to faith and becoming part of the church is they would have had um, the trappings of idolatry that they were bringing along with them, like worshiping all sorts of other gods in the Greek and Roman pantheon of gods that were there. But one of the things the Apostle Paul is saying to the Gentile Christians coming in, he's saying there is only one true God. Abandon all else. Serve Him and Him alone. He would say at the end of verse 6, that God, this one God, is over all, through all, and in all. He's over all, over everything, rules over everything. He does not share any piece of His creation with any one or any other small g God. And they don't exist, by the way. God does not share anything. Well, except for all of these beautiful qualities of himself, love, joy. Of course he shares all that. But what I mean is he doesn't share anything that he owns. Like it all belongs to him. We steward it and he gives us certain things graciously. But God's over all of it. He owns it all. He's over all, through all. So all people who come to know him, come to know him through him, because of him, because of his spirit. He's through all. And in all, meaning in all things, in all aspects of life, in everything we do, we ought to give glory to God. He rules all, he's through all, he's in all. Only God is worthy of our devotion then. And for the Gentile Christians, that would have been a particularly challenging message because they may have been tempted to hold on to many of the other idols and many of the other pagan gods, maybe just in case, right? Like, I believe that Jesus is my Savior, but just in case, I'm going to hold on to Zeus or Apollo, Diana, Artemis, I, just in case. Now, God, he's not going to care if I just kind of casually keep those idols off the side, right? Just in case, you never know. I've got to hedge my bets here, right? I can't put all my eggs in one basket because what if Jesus isn't the one way, truth, and life? And at least I'll have been pleasing to some of these gods, at least in part. Now see, what the Apostle Paul was saying was, you've got to abandon all those. First of all, they aren't real, they aren't true, they don't even exist. Secondly, God is over all. So even if they did exist, God is over all of them. He rules over all, through all, and in all, so you cannot be devoted to anything but Him. He's telling us a worthy walk is devoted to God in, in all things. All the areas of my life deserve to give Him glory and honor. Walk worthily, because God Himself is worthy. So then I'd ask you then this morning, are there areas of my life that I don't honor God in? That I don't recognize His rule over all? Like, when I'm at work, on the job site, do I recognize God's rule over me there? You young people, as you're in school, do you recognize God's rule there? Certainly it's easy to recognize it while you're at church or youth group or kids club in this. But what about at school? What about on the field of athletics? And it's easy to recognize God's rule when everybody around me is a Christian as well, like at church. But what about on the field of athletics? School, at work. Are there idols that I'm secretly harboring on the side? Maybe this creeping temptation comes into mind like, what if Jesus isn't the only way? What if I've got to just live for myself because maybe this is all that I have? So maybe the temptation to be materialistic, greedy, the temptation to believe that I've just got to make it to retirement because that's when the joy begins. The temptation to believe that I need toys, fun, and recreation and vacation because, well, after all, I don't know for sure if there's life after death, so I'm going to hedge my bet with all these other things as well. Are there other idols that I'm harboring on the side? Are there areas of my life that I don't honor God in? Last Sunday, 
after Bible study, me and Jason were talking a little bit, and I brought up this phrase that I kind of, I don't like. It's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. I don't really like a lot. Pastors will use it from time to time. Um, you hear it particularly uh, given to young people, right, as they're first maybe getting their independence, going off to school for the first time. Maybe they've just become a Christian, and so then they're thinking about, you know, how can they commit their lives to the Lord. So you hear some pastors, youth pastors, other, other books written about this phrase, and, and it goes like this. It's kind of a question put to the audience. It can be to anyone, but again, a lot of times it's to youth. Are you fully surrendered? Maybe you've heard you know, a pastor preach, maybe even me, say something like that. Like, are you fully surrendered? There's a couple of reasons I don't like that phrase. First of all, it's just illogical. You can't be fully surrendered or partially surrendered. You're either surrendered or you're not. Right? There's no in between. Like, think about it. Let's go back to World War II. Let's, let's imagine Germany surrenders, but they say, we're going to surrender except for Poland. We're going to keep Poland. Like, the Allies are going like, to, wait a minute. No, no, no. There's no such thing as partial surrender here, Germany. You're either surrendered or not. Or what if they found out that Germany was, like, fighting still behind the scenes? They're still at war. Well, then the reality is you're not surrendered in any sense of it. You're still at war. Well, it's just illogical to begin with. And I get what maybe pastors are doing when they say you need to be fully surrendered. What they mean to say is you're going to experience temptation and you're going to experience the clinging of sin in your life. And so we need to be rooting it out constantly in life and trying to turn away from it, abandoning it, and turning to Christ day after day, take up your cross daily and follow him, this kind of stuff. And they're using the phrase fully surrendered in a sense of like, constantly be looking for how you can surrender to the Lord. I get that. The reason I don't like it is because, first of all, it's illogical. We should just be saying you're surrendered or not. Because if there are holdouts in your life, if there is some territory in your heart that isn't surrendered to God, then you're at war with him. Right? Like, how could we appear before a holy God and say, God, I surrendered three quarters of my heart to you, but I just, I really, really enjoyed and loved this other quarter that was you know, sinful and rebellious. That's at war with God. Like, that's not surrender. That's not partial surrender. That's just complete and utter rebellion. And so, first of all, it's illogical to say be fully surrendered as if it were possible to be partially surrendered. It's not. You either are surrendered to God or you're not. But then secondly, when we use that phrase, fully surrendered, what I've seen happen oftentimes, and I felt it in my own heart, like the temptation to think this way, what happens or what can happen for a Christian is they begin believing maybe that it's okay to be partially surrendered. It's okay to harbor idols or rebellion in my life because, you know, the pastor is telling me to be fully surrendered and that's a wonderful thing for, you know, the super Christians to try to attain to. I'm just the average churchgoer, just trying to live my life. And so some people are going to maybe attain to fully surrendered, but I'm just going to be satisfied with partially surrendered. Thanks for the encouragement, Pastor, but I'll just stay in the partially surrendered category. See, it makes me believe that there are Christians out there who think it's okay, since we're encouraging fully surrendered, maybe it's okay to just make do with partially surrendered. But I just don't believe that the Bible shows us any other way other than either fully surrendered or not. Now let me be quick to say that, yes, you and I are going to experience the clinging of sin day after day after day. In a sense, I understand you might not feel fully surrendered if we use that phrase properly. You might not feel like you are surrendered to God. The case is, that means we need to be constantly coming before Him, repenting, seeking to turn away from sin, seeking to live for Him. So when the Bible says, take up your cross daily and to be sanctified, you're being more and more conformed into the image of Jesus day by day. All of these are true. The reality is for the Christian, if you are surrendered to God, when it becomes apparent that there's an area of your life that is off or rebellious, the heart of surrender will say, that's going to change. When the Holy Spirit convicts me and says, you're harboring an idol over here, a heart of surrender will say, that's got to go. 
that's got to change. If I say to the Holy Spirit, I'm not getting rid of that idol. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to hold on to it for longer. Think about what you're saying. That's not partial surrender. That's just complete and utter rebellion. So when, so this is the difference between saying fully surrendered or just surrendered. When we commit as a church to being surrendered to Christ, yes, the Holy Spirit's going to reveal things in me that aren't right, perhaps even daily. But the surrendered heart will say, I don't want any of those things. I will run from those things. And when the Spirit of God or the pastor of the church, the Word of God reveals those things to me, I am going to abandon them. A heart of surrender will say, no more of that. I want more of Christ. So a walk worthy of the calling is devoted to God in all things. Not full surrender, just surrender. He is Lord for all. So think about how God is calling us today, church, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. A worthy walk is empowered by God. A worthy walk reflects the new purpose and identity given by God. And a worthy walk is devoted to God in all things. This is why we ought to go God's way. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you and we consider this great calling that you've called us to, I pray that you would instill in our hearts these great reasons why we should be following you. Because you're with us, because you've given us new purpose, new identity, and because you are worthy. You are worthy to be called Lord over all things in all areas of my life. So help us, Father, to be able to surrender. Help us to find unity not only with you, but with our church family. Help us to understand the empowerment that you've given so that we would be motivated to walk in a manner worthy of the call. We pray this for your glory and honor. Amen. We invite you to stand as we sing in closing, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, we pray for your grace and mercy to be upon us. Help us to live for you, walking in a manner worthy of your call. But help us have a great vision, Lord, of what you've done for us, um, that you are holy and you are good, but you've saved us, saved us to your holiness. So, Father, we thank you for these great truths. Pray that our hearts and lives would honor you. Jesus, we pray. Amen.